Yes, uh, this is my first time in Hudson, though I grew up downriver from here um, on the banks of the Cuyahoga. The first time I went to England and saw the Thames River, I was amazed that a river could have grass growing right down to its banks. I thought that rivers had slag heaps next to them, you know, so. And yes, I know Sandy Fraser from having copy edited his work at the New Yorker, and I emailed him before coming here to tell him I was coming to his hometown and told him I didn't know what I would read to his fellow citizens about. What would people like to know about? Would you like to know about commas or hyphens or dashes or um, sem perhaps semicolons? Um, I have a chapter on profanity and one on apostrophes. There's a very hardcore chapter on grammar that deals with case and has words in it like accusative, which will put hair on your chest or curl your hair or straighten if it's already curly, or spelling or pronunciation. And what Sandy said to me was, um, tell them about your jobs in Cleveland. <laughs> So that's what I'm going to do. Um, first, though, I when I was looking for the chapter about my jobs in Cleveland, which is right at the beginning of the book, I turned to my epigram. And I'm going to read you my epigram. It's from a book called The Art of the Footnote by Francis A. Burkle Young and Sandra Rose Maley. And it goes like this. Of course, when you correct the errors of others, do so with kindness, in the hope that later writers will be as kind when they correct yours. Some people were very kind when they pointed out my errors. Some people neglected to read the epigram, I think, but it must be karma I set up, what goes around comes around, and I must have cruelly corrected somebody at some point, and maybe I'll, maybe I'll earn it off eventually. <laughs> I hope so. Anyway, this is how the book begins. The introduction is called Confession of a Comma Queen. Let's get one thing straight right from the beginning. I didn't set out to be a comma queen. The first job I ever had the summer I was 15 was checking feet at a public pool in Cleveland. I was a key girl. Key personnel was the job title on my pay stub. I never knew what that was supposed to mean. I was not in charge of any keys, and my position was by no means crucial to the operation of the pool, although I did clean the bathrooms. Everyone had to follow an elaborate ritual before getting into the pool. Tuck your hair into a hideous bathing cap, if you were a girl, shower, wade through a foot bath spiked with disinfectant that tinted your feet orange, and stand in line to have your toes checked. This took place at a special wooden bench like those things that salesmen use, shoe salesmen, I mean, except that instead of a miniature sliding board and a size stick for the customer's foot, it had a stick with a foot-shaped platform on top. The prospective swimmer put one foot at a time on the platform and, leaning forward, used his fingers to spread out his toes so that the foot checker could make sure he didn't have athlete's foot. Only then could he pass into the pool. I have never heard of foot checkers in any city besides Cleveland where their presence was taken for granted and can only speculate that one time there was an outbreak of athlete's foot on the shores of Lake Erie and a crusading public health official determined to stamp it out had these benches knocked together and hired people to sit at them checking feet. Now, since the publication of the book, I have heard from people in other cities where there was a, where foot checking was a ritual. They were mostly in Indiana, Illinois, and Wisconsin, confirming my suspicion that this was a Great Lakes phenomenon. <laughs> also, I didn't actually know what athlete's foot looked like. And I'm happy to say I still don't. I'm not particularly nostalgic about my foot-checking days, nor do I wish to revisit my time at the Cleveland Costume Company, where I worked after graduation from college. I had gone to Douglas College, the Women's College of Rutgers University in New Brunswick, New Jersey, 
and I had returned ignominiously to the nest because I couldn't think of anything better to do. The costume company was fun for a while, renting props to local TV shows, putting together costumes for summer stock productions of restoration drama. On my first day, a young black woman, Yvonne, was setting Santa beards in rollers so that they would be curly by Christmas. An older black woman worked in the kitchen, starching and ironing the clown ruffs and nun's wimples. She changed from street shoes into bedroom slippers when she got to work and said things like, my dogs is killing me. <laughs> the boss was Mrs. Pizzino. P e is in Peter, I, double Z is in zebra, I N O, she would say, spelling out her last name over the phone. And under her tutelage, I learned to repair big paper mache animal heads and not to paint the panther's eyes blue. Halloween had always been my favorite holiday, and I borrowed a costume from work, a hooded green corduroy robe like something a fairy tale dwarf would wear, and threw a party in my parents' basement. It featured copious amounts of alcohol and candy. One of the guests came as a penis, <laughs> another as a Ku Klux Klansman. Initially, I was sorry that Yvonne declined my invitation, but not anymore. When the party was over, I decided that my career at the costume company had peaked and I was going to quit. Accordingly, I slept in the next day and was awakened by my mother saying that Mrs. Badino was on the phone. <laughs> Mom never got Mrs. Pizzino's name straight. I explained to my boss that now that Halloween was over, I thought I'd quit. Her response was, get in here. <laughs> There is just as much to do at a costume company after the holiday as there is in the weeks leading up to it. I stuck it out through the Christmas season, and after all the Santa suits had been cleaned and put away and Yvonne was rolling up the beards again, I started looking around. I called a local dairy and asked whether there were any openings for milkmen. I had had a fantasy for years about owning a dairy farm. I liked cows. They led a placid yet productive life. I'd gone to Rut Rutgers partly because it had a renowned department of dairy science. I'd taken one course in how to judge dairy cattle and learned the differences between Holsteins, Guernseys, Jerseys, and brown Swiss cows. We've never had a lady drive a milk truck, but there's no reason not, a man said, and he agreed to let me come in and talk. The plant was all gleaming stainless steel, heated milk undercut with a bracing whiff of ammonia. It was the first time I could be completely honest in a job interview. I didn't have any experience, but I was sincerely interested in the dairy industry. On a frigid morning in February, I went along with a milkman on a route in Fairview Park. The milk truck had two sets of pedals, one with the standard three for a stick shift, for driving sitting down when you were going long distances, and the other for driving standing up when you were hopping between houses. The second set had just two pedals. The clutch and the brake were combined in one. When you needed to slow down or shift gears, your left foot squeezed down through the clutch to the brake on one pedal, and you had to lift your right foot off the accelerator and balance on your right heel. The route was available, and they gave me the job. A generous friend lent me her car for a crash course in how to drive a stick shift. <laughs> the foreman who was training me noticed that I handled the truck better standing up than sitting down. The seat was designed to fold up and swing around to the side where it could be stowed out of the way. And from all that folding and swinging, it had loosened up. So when I turned the steering wheel, the seat swung in the opposite direction. And I would find myself facing out the side instead of in the direction the truck was going, as if I were on some disorienting amusement park ride. At the foreman's suggestion, I was driving back to the plant standing up on Brook Park Road out near the airport. I went through an underpass on the far side of which was a traffic light, and I was almost under it when I saw that it was red, so I had to slam on the brake and try to steer while gripping the steering wheel and balancing on one heel, and I lost control. The truck crashed into a concrete barrier. 
The foreman was thrown into the ice cream freezer, and I landed on the floor. He was okay. I was bruised and humiliated. The plant had its own tow truck and mechanic, which should have been some clue that things like this had happened before. And I rode back with the mechanic, wanting to bum one of his unfiltered camels. The foreman got blamed because the boss said he shouldn't have had me driving standing up, and I got another chance. I had some really nice customers. There was a couple who bought only a pint of half and half once a week for their coffee. And I had some deadbeats, the kind of people who knew that if they ever paid their bill in full, you'd drop them. There was a man who rehabilitated coin changers, those contraptions with barrels for quarters, nickels, pennies, and dimes. We wore them on our belts. The houses had milk chutes or boxes beside the door, or you put the milk between the storm door and the inside door and shouted, Milkman! Well, I wasn't a man, but I didn't like the word lady. It seemed not feminist. So I wouldn't holler, Milk lady! And milk maid was a little too fanciful. <laughs> I settled for a milk woman, which was a bit too anatomically correct and made me sound like a wet nurse. <laughs> I muffled the last syllable. Milk woman. <laughs> I had half a mind to stay in Cleveland and try to marry the boss's son. He raised beef cattle. But I gave up the milk route to accept a fellowship at the University of Vermont, where I had applied too late the year before. While pursuing a master's degree in English, I kept up my interest in the dairy industry. UVM had an agricultural school and a famous ice cream program. I even learned to milk cows, though they were university cows, Holsteins, big producers. My first job once I left the academic life was packaging mozzarella on a night shift in a cheese factory. A team of women wearing white rubber aprons, yellow rubber gloves, green rubber boots, and hairnets pulled bricks of mozzarella out of vats of cold salt water, labeled them, bagged them, sealed the bags, boxed the cheese, and stacked the boxes. I had a secret yen to operate the forklift truck. The Popeye-style muscles I developed in my forearms atrophied soon after I moved to New York. Sometimes, on the sides of trucks making deliveries to pizzerias, I still recognize the logos of cheese wholesalers, Vesuvio, Cremona, in red, white, and green, whose labels we slapped onto loaves of mozzarella in Vermont. I don't suppose that I will ever belong to the Brotherhood of Teamsters again or have calluses on my palms from handling a stainless steel carrier full of half gallons of milk. So I started reading The New Yorker while I was in graduate school. In Vermont, I kept two stacks of magazines on my coffee table, one of Horde's Dairyman and one of The New Yorker. <laughs> John McPhee's series about Alaska ran in The New Yorker that year. And I fell in love with his use of words, his very precise, loving placement of words. And I made up my mind to move to New York in the course of a phone call with my brother in the fall of 1977. Um, Dee had made friends with a, a very nice couple. Dee had gone to New York on a scholarship to the Art Students League and in a portrait class, once he couldn't see the model, so he painted the woman who was painting next to him, a fellow student, and she liked the painting and bought it. And she turned out to be Jeanne Fleischmann, the wife of Peter Fleischmann, the son of Raoul Fleischmann, the founder with Harold Ross of The New Yorker. So when I moved to New York, I, I, Dee gave me his loft. These, Dee made a living at the time by playing the harp in a bear suit in Central Park. And <laughs> he was going to take that act to Paris for the winter, so um, I got the loft. Dee just got into a lot of trouble in Paris. They didn't think it was quite so charming there for some reason. So um, it, uh, while I was in, in New York, my first job there was a reverse commute from the financial district to Patterson, New Jersey, where I washed dishes in a friend's restaurant. The friend paid my bus, bus fare and gave me all the beer I could, I could drink. In return, I tried not to throw away the silverware when I scraped the dishes. 
Often I got off the bus and walked home over the George Washington Bridge. I worked on my thesis. I had chosen to write a thesis on James Thurber, another Ohioan, and sometimes despaired. I was not good at academic writing. Writing is always hard, and when you don't want to do it, it's, <laughs> it's especially hard. So Peter Fleshman, who was my friend by then, had pointed out that even if I never finished the thesis or got the master's degree, it was no reason to despair. I had spent many a cocktail hour in the, the Fleshman's den, drinking their Heineken and listening to Peter's stories. Peter drank scotch and water, chain-smoked Marlboros, and swallowed Maalox by the handful. He had a very stressful job. He told war stories. He was in the Battle of the Bulge. And stories about Yale, where he went to school, and about his father, Raoul. The family came from Vienna and croquet games he had witnessed as a child with Harpo Marx banking a shot off a spare tire that he had sawed apart and wrapped around a tree trunk. So Peter arranged for me to speak with the executive editor at the magazine. Like his father, he kept business and editorial strictly separate so he couldn't actually get a job for me, but he did call the executive editor and say, I was going to call, and I did call, and I spoke to that editor, and there were no openings. So I boldly quit my dishwashing job anyway, <laughs> and I got a job um, as a secretary, temp secretary, typing, statistical typing. It was, it was awful. And I also had a job at Corvettes, which was a discount department store. During the Christmas season, I was a cashier, and I didn't know whether I wanted them to recognize my talent and keep me on after the Christmas season or let me go, but they did let me go. <laughs> <laughs> so my next idea was to get a hack license and drive a cab. I still had my chauffeur's license from the milk route, so it would have been a total disaster because I didn't know my way around New York at all. So Peter, recognizing a possible ambulance in my future, suggested that I give a follow-up call to the editor at The New Yorker. And there was an opening. There were two, in fact, one in the typing pool and one in the editorial library. I flunked the test for the typing pool. It was on an electric typewriter, and I was used to a manual. At least that was my excuse. If my hands trembled over the keyboard, the typewriter took off without me. The interview in the editorial library was like the one at the dairy in that I didn't have to lie to get the job. I wanted to work at the New Yorker. And once I got a whiff of the library, that bookish, dusty, paste and paper smell so peculiar to libraries, I felt that I was in my element. Helen Stark, who was only the second person ever to be in charge of the New Yorker library, had a noble head. You could see her profile on a coin and strong features. She and three girls sat at desks that faced each other in a cloverleaf arrangement. Helen gave me a typing test on a manual typewriter, cramming words onto an index card. I aced it and borrowed an empty office for the interview. I remember her arranging her skirt, which was black and wide at the hem when she crossed her legs. My own skirt was a forest green danskin wraparound that a friend had picked up at a thrift shop in New Jersey, and I didn't realize until the next time I wore it that one end of the hem hung some eight inches longer than the other. <laughs> I was all aglow, and Helen warned me that it was not a glamorous job, but she knew from experience that nothing she said could dim my enthusiasm or overturn my conviction that I would soon be one of the young friends whose letters were published in Talk of the Town. The call came the next day, a Friday, and I started the next Monday. It was snowing, and Helen Stark took me upstairs to the makeup department on the 19th floor. That's not cosmetics or hairstyling, but production where they did the layout of the magazine. The magazine went to press on Monday afternoon in those days, and the men in makeup who lived in the Bronx had come in on the train the night before and stayed in a hotel across the street so that the blizzard wouldn't prevent them from getting to work. A notice from the editor, William Sean, went up on the bulletin board saying that anyone whose work was not essential could go home. Nobody wanted to think they were not essential. 
It was cozy in the makeup room during the blizzard. The men reminisced about the blackout of 77 just the summer before when an editor named Gardner Botsford had marshaled everyone into the makeup department and organized the evacuation. As Helen and I were leaving that night, an editor named Pat Crow got on the elevator at the 18th floor with us. I noticed his boots, big mud green rubber boots, and said, those are the kind of boots we wore in the cheese factory. <laughs> he looked at Helen and said, so this is the next stop after the cheese factory? <laughs> wow. yeah. He had those rubber boots because he was a fly fisherman, a trout fisherman. I learned later he kept, um, he tied flies in his office. He had a whole setup with different feathers and things, and he would teach, teach anyone who was interested <laughs> how to tie flies. So since we have some time, I'm going to read a little bit more about, um, I decided I will write, I will read about dashes, okay? Um, they're a very versatile thing, and they uh, also tie into Cleveland and uh, local color. So, <laughs> This is from Chapter 7. It's called A Dash, a Semicolon, and a Colon Walk into a Bar. <laughs> Punctuation is a deeply conservative club. It hardly ever admits a new member. In the 60s, an ad man invented the interrobang a combined question mark and exclamation point, but it did not catch on. Still, considering that we have only a handful of tools, think of them as needles and pins in a sewing kit, or drill bits and screws in a, screws in a toolbox, the variety of ticks that writers develop and effects that they create is astonishing. Even the period which marks the end of a conventional declarative sentence can be nuanced in context. I paged through a copy of Celine's Death on the Installment Plan, a book that was given to me years ago and I have never found the right moment to read. It just doesn't sound like a beach book. <laughs> and see sentences strung together like beads, ellipses, float on for page after page. It seemed very modern, like the tendency for an email to trail off, inviting an answer. You realize after a while that when you come to the end, Nothing is going to seem as desperate as that final period. Which piece of punctuation has the most gumption? You might think it is the exclamation point, also known in copy editing circles as the screamer, because it is used sparingly and packs a punch. In German, every command ends with an exclamation point, or at least they used to. One imagines that Germans bark at each other a lot. The question mark, by contrast, is gentle, a lazy Irishman. When an utterance is both declarative and interrogative, say, what the devil? People are sometimes tempted to use both a question mark and an exclam exclamation point, but that is a bad idea. Word order will take care of the interrogative, while the bold exclamation point trumps the timid question mark every time. The interior punctuation that goes on in sentences is even more subtle. It's like a family. We have built on the comma and the period and come up with some pretty tough characters, as well as some snobs and some sainted family members who are ready for anything. For instance, the Dash family. In case the conversation at the dinner table ever turns to dashes, it is best to be prepared. It can happen. You can hold the table spellbound with anecdotes about the Dash family. For instance, when I was nine, we moved from a two-family house on West 39th Street on the west side of Cleveland out to Meadowbrook Avenue, which was all but technically in the suburbs. My father was a fireman, and he had to live within the, city, the limits of the city of Cleveland. I was eager to move. I would have my own bedroom in a two-story house with a real fake fireplace. But I didn't realize until we were in the new house how much character the old one had had. The neighborhood was on the edge of the zoo and full of hillbillies and immigrants, DPs in my mother's term, displaced persons. 
One man came out in the middle of the night who had just moved there because he thought he heard someone crying for help, and it was the peacock from the zoo. I can still do a pretty good peacock call. So, help! <laughs> I'll turn, I'm not going to try it again. So, oh, oh well, help! <laughs> Our neighbors had names like Munchauer, Sindelar, Kurfanta, Slifka. Years later, I learned that it was Polish for plum. The new neighborhood was on the other side of the zoo. There were no fences between the houses, and at first, we interpreted that to mean that we could run through people's yards. Strike one. Sit on people's benches. Strike two. And coast down the driveway on our ancient oversized tricycle and up the driveway across the street. Strike three. Our new neighbors had names like Blank and Dash. Seriously, Mr. and Mrs. Blank next door were a crabby old couple who yelled at us when our badminton birdie landed on their lawn. We used a pair of my mother's clothes poles to retrieve it. We had a ball doing that. For some reason, we called the clothes poles the anchovies. We didn't know what anchovies were, but when the, the birdie would go on their lawn, we'd scream and yell, time for the anchovies, and we'd run to the garage for the clothes poles. The dashes lived next to the blanks on the other side. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> they employed a diaper service and were customers of Charles Chips, the house-to-house -house potato chip vendor. You remember Charles Chips? If you have no personal anecdotes to share about the dashes, feel free to appropriate mine. Lowercase dashes also provide hours of dinner conversation. Dashes, like table forks, come in different sizes, and there is a proper use for each. The handiest member of the dash family is the 1M dash. Think of it as the dinner fork, the one on the inside, which you use for your main dish. The M is a printer's unit approximately the width of a capital letter M. We who grew up using typewriters learned to type two hyphens with or without space on either side to form a dash. Most word processing programs automatically fuse double hyphens into a solid dash when you get to the end of the word following it. That is, the computer automatically compensates for old-fashioned habits. There is also one N dash, the width of a capital N. That would be your salad fork. Some clever writers type two one ends instead of two hyphens to form the long dash, and it looks good, but it's brittle. If it falls on a line break, it snaps in half. The end dash works more like a hyphen than like a dash, connecting compound words such as the New York New Haven Railroad. Oh, some use it to relieve hyphen congestion in a phrase such as chocolate chocolate chip ice cream cone. I find this awkward, as if one leg were longer than the other. If you think of all the use of the dash, all the uses of the dash, it can stand at the head of a line to indicate an item in a list. It can be deployed like a colon. It introduces an amplification of what is to, has come before. It can be employed in pairs within a sentence, like the comma, and is subject to some of the basic rules of the comma. It can be used instead of quotation marks to set off dialogue. James Joyce does this, and a lot of European writers. It can create a sense of drama, false drama. It can be used within dialogue in place of a semicolon, and it is actually more realistic. Most people don't think in semicolons. It can work as a defiant alternative to a period at the end. It can end a sentence abruptly to show that a thought has been or upped it. <laughs> and it can pick up where you left off. There are writers who despise the dash. The sheer range of it suggests that it's a lazy, all-purpose substitute for more disciplined forms of punctuation. Women seem to use it a lot, especially in correspondence, as if it were a woman's prerogative to stop short without explanation, to be a little vague, to have a sudden change of heart to leave things open-ended. A friend of mine once swept aside all rules governing punctuation by saying, whenever you feel a pause, put in a dash. The most famous proponent of the dash was, of course, the poet Emily Dickinson. And it is because of her that, for me, the dash has a feminine slant.
With Emily Dickinson at the table, my simplistic division of dashes into table forks and salad forks falls apart. She used dashes for everything, sometimes for two things at once. If a different size and style of fork were assigned to each of her various dashes, the table setting would require not just dessert forks, but fondue forks, and those tiny forks used for teasing snails out of their shells, also tuning forks, maybe even a pitchfork. Dickinson's dashes have given rise to an entire academic industry. There is still no agreement among scholars over which of our conventional dashes suit her typographically. If you think of dashes as just an aid to conventional syntax, you won't understand what's going on in Emily Dickinson. I was once in the position, just once, of having to copy edit uh, first by Emily Dickinson because it was quoted in the New Yorker. And I did, I just failed utter, inutterably. I used the, the New Yorker dash, which is smack up against the word before it, and she, her dashes floated. But I just couldn't wrap my, my mind around it, so I, um, I was the worst possible copy editor for Emily Dickinson. When I set out to write about her in this book, a friend of mine who is a, a scholar of Emily Dickinson told me that I had to use the edition by R.W. Franklin, Ralph Franklin, and I found that what he used for all her dashes was a hyphen, not a 1M dash floating or a 1M dash, but a simple hyphen with space on either side because that was the mark that had the least content and therefore was the most open to interpretation. He also noted that because her poems were written as a, in a private genre like letters, her practice, he thought, should be followed as closely as possible. I went to an exhibit of Dickinson's pencil jottings on odds and ends of paper. They were on envelopes, receipts, wrapping paper that were published eventually as an art book called The Gorgeous Noth Nothings. They were under glass and distorted by reflections from the overhead lights. You really couldn't really inspect them without slobbering on the vitrine. An artist friend who had been somewhat irritated by the show asked about Dickinson, didn't she have any pads of paper? <laughs> <laughs> My feeling was that any poet who can get so much satisfaction out of such a small mark, she actually got emotion out of the dots over her eyes by using, putting sort of a vertical dash over them, that she deserves to have her dashes respected. The dots and dashes actually put me in mind of telegrams, an obsolete form of communication, the Twitter of its time, that had its own style, almost an anti-style, lacking any form of punctuation except the uninflected command, stop. And I'm going to take that as a cue to stop. <laughs> So thank you very much, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to, to answer them. Thank you. Yes, sir. Would you mind describing a typical day of yours at the New Yorker? And also, when, when you read something, say, by John McPhee, and you find places where you might want to change, how does he respond to that? Um, well, let me answer the questions backwards. Uh, John McPhee is one of the, you know, he's one of the great writers, as is Sandy Fraser. And those writers, the best writers, are always the most open to um, feedback. It's only writers who are defensive because, for their own reasons, um, they don't, they think every comma, every well, Emily Dickinson might have been one of them, I don't know. Um, every dash is precious, and they cling to it for reasons that might be obscure. And you, you argue with them a little. Um, but John McPhee, you just can be completely straightforward with. Um, he does sometimes put in jokes that I don't get, and I am a little intimidated about admitting. I always give him the benefit of the doubt. I find some reason to think this is funny. <laughs> and often I'm wrong. It means something completely different. And I'm always glad to find out what it is that he meant. Um, 
a typical day at the New Yorker, our offices are now in the, the New World Trade Center. And I can never mention this without stating bitterly that I don't have a window. <laughs> What's the point in being on the 38th floor of the New World Trade Center if you can't look out, right? So I do get up and look out other people's windows. We're st <laughs> Our hours traditionally have been 10 to 6. We start late. Um, it's just an old tradition at the New Yorker. We like to avoid rush hour. <laughs> and also, by the time I do my work, um, usually... I cannot do my work until someone else has finished a job and then, then it's ready for me. But we, and we stay past six, we stay until the work is done. Um, the week, the magazine closes now on a Friday, so we try to close it in an organized way over the course of the week. Things that are not timely, the fiction, the departments, criticism, book notes, they'll close on Monday and Tuesday. The long fact pieces close on Wednesday and Friday. And we end up staying pretty late sometimes for those. And the last thing to close is comment and talk of the town that closes on Friday. Um, we read everything. When I read something, I read it twice always. We read uh, when something is first set up, goes from manuscript into copy, it gets its copy edited. And that's a very conservative treatment. Um, we just fix the spellings if they're misspelled and we we put New Yorker spelling on other words, um, whether the writers like it or not, that's, you know, we use those two dots over the second O and cooperate and we um, double the L in traveler, and things like that. And what's the other word, focused, we have two S's in. And I'm so used to that that if it didn't have two S's, I would pronounce it focused. So. <laughs> But new editors always say, is this right? They can't believe that we do that. So that's the first stage. Second stage, once it's in galleys, that the single columns, somebody, one of the okayers, that's on um, a higher level of copy editor, reads it in galley, and that's less mechanical and more interpretive. Things that are wrong but that are not, there's not just one way to fix um, you suggest ways to fix it. And then I read that twice, the first time mostly for content, and the second time I always think I'll get through it faster, but in fact it always takes me longer. That's when things start to pop out, inconsistencies and things I missed the first time. And I always run spell check, just in case. And I, it usually catches some teeny nasty little typo that I didn't notice. Then the, when the piece is in layout, we split up the contents of the magazine. There's about five what we call page okayers or query proofreaders. And I'll be assigned maybe one department and one long fact piece, or we switch off closing talk of the town because that involves sometimes staying late on Friday and nobody should get stuck with that job every week. So we read them, we give the proof to the editor, at when a piece closes, we have a closing meeting. The editor, the author, sometimes via telephone, the page okayer, a query proofreader, and the fact checker all sit down together and go through the piece page by page to refine it, to catch any more mistakes we can, and then we send it to the printer, and then there is yet another level of proofreaders who read it when we're done with it. That's the safety net. They're called the foundry, foundry proofreaders. And then when it comes around the next week, we're, we've already moved on to the next issue. So there isn't that much satisfaction in a finished product that you would think there would be, I'm sorry to say. Thank you. Thank you. Yes? Can you comment on some of the things you see happening with current so-called standard American English? I sense a trick question. <laughs> Um, let's see, most, a lot of people ask me what I think of uh, Twitter and the, the use of abbreviations and emojis and, um, oh, I, maybe it's even conversational style in print. And my feeling is that those things are appropriate for where they are. But once something is, is going into print, 
that, um, I mean, fiction should sound like the narrator. You get, you give, we give more license to the writers of fiction and um, writers of fact pieces and critics. You know, if a writer has an individual style, and I hope most writers do, they don't all. Um, you know, all we do is try to make it correct in as far as the writers will let us. If they want to leave something in their own voice, you know, we, we let them do that as long as it reads smoothly and doesn't stop a reader. Um, th things are changing. You know, there are a lot of rules that I learned growing up that I don't obey anymore. I freely end a sentence with a preposition. Um, I, and I don't correct writers. You know, I don't change that in a writer. I, I split infinitives. The writers who don't split infinitives, they hate it if you try to split their infinitives. So I don't do that. I learned the hard way. <laughs> Not to do that. Don't make anyone write in a looser style than he already writes in. That's not the way to go. Tighten it up, yes, but never make it looser. <laughs> um, there is a sentence in my book that has gotten a lot of um, comment from, I've gotten a lot of emails and a lot of letters. It's in the um, chapter about gender, and the sentence is that D was two years younger than me. And a lot of people think that they learn that that should be then I, because than is a coordinating conjunction, and it, there's an uh, invisible verb after I. So D was two, year, two years younger than I was. It, sh it should have read, they think. But than is also a preposition. It's in the dictionary. It's, and there are usage experts who feel strongly that the me is, as a following preposition is um, the um, accusative form of the pronoun and that you can use me and that's what I was doing. Also I was introducing a section that was very personal. So it really bothered me that people wrote in about it because didn't they recognize that this was something I was very sensitive about? This is not when you start correcting people's grammar. <laughs> so. Yes? Why do they differ, and what they differ from, let's say, a magazine versus a newspaper? Why they differ? It just, it must depend. Did everyone hear the question? It was, a, he wants to know, do they differ? Does everyone have their own style? Does every newspaper, magazine, publisher have its own style? And the answer is yes. Uh, me newspapers, for instance, do not f follow, they don't use the same dictionary that our magazine does. We use Web Webster's, Merriam Webster's Collegiate Dictionary, the little red web, and we fall back on the new online unabridged Webster's, which would be Web 4 if they ever numbered it. But also we have Webster's second international unabridged, which we use, and Webster's third, which I fondled a copy of just earlier. Can I tell you, when I took her on the tour of the library and we were up in the new fiction, or in the fiction section, the very first thing she did was look at all the dictionary. <laughs> it's a very beautiful edition, I was happy to say. Um, but Webster's was very, where did that question come from? That was you, okay. Yeah, Webster's was very controversial back in the 60s when they introduced Webster's Third because it had ain't in it and um, the prescriptivists got all up in arms. Turns out ain't was also in the previous dictionary, but it was all caused by the publicity campaign for the new dictionary, or most of it. And that's when the prescriptivists, that's the sticklers, got separated from the descriptivists, and that's the people who just put in the dictionary the things that people say. And that's also legitimate. But because there was this big argument, this big controversy, the New York Times, for instance, decided, well, we're going to stay away from Webster's. This is too 
um, inflammatory, and they turned to Webster's New World Dictionary, which was published in Cleveland at the time. It was a publisher of Bibles and dictionaries. It's since been taken over by maybe Macmillan, I'm not sure. But Webster, Merriam Webster's, I know, is still very sad that that happened. So first of all, they'll use a different dictionary. Some publishers use Random House, and some use American Heritage. Book publishers use the dictionary they publish, generally. <laughs> and then and then the New York Times has style, just different ways of doing things, um, that they, they have a style so that the front of the magazine or newspaper spells words the same as the back. You know, they want it to be uniform. That's pleasing to people. They're, it's like a menu in a restaurant. It always, you can rely on it to have the same things in it all the time. So... Um, all the all magazines will have a style sheet just to simplify the operation. And whoever decides, uh, I guess it would be the editor-in-chief. The New Yorker at one time had a style editor. And um, the original editor, Harold Ross, was a bit of an Anglophile, which is why the New Yorker still spells theater the British way with an R-E on the end. And he was also a Francophile, which is why the New Yorker puts accents on everything, even capital letters, which the French don't do. So we're even more French than the French. <laughs> yes. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned Gladwell because he is particularly hard to copy edit because there's something about the surface of his prose that's almost glassy. It defies you to change anything. I mentioned this once at a, an outdoor writer's festival and it started to storm. <laughs> I thought, uh oh, never mention the writers you have trouble copy editing again. Um, I would say that we really, we, once you start making exceptions, you get into trouble with people. And the writers, you know, some, if somebody has a preference, um, there was a writer, I'm forgetting his name, but he wrote Nicholas and Alexander. Uh, he wrote about the Russian royal family. Robert Massey, he was just here a couple months ago. Yeah, Robert Massey. Yes, Robert K. Massey. Robert K. Massey. All right, when he wrote for us, we had a style on czar, C-Z-A-R, and he just ridiculed that. He knew Russian. We didn't. We were just, <laughs> somebody just decided how to spell czar, and he said it would be more correct to spell it T-S-A-R. So not only did we let Robert K. Massey spell it T-S-A-R, but we changed our style after that. So, you know, there is always a back and forth, um, both, both parties being very serious about their point of view. Yes? With the trends in the, the marketplace for journalism, what do you recommend to those who are majoring in journalism right now, Tom? Well, basically, I recommend, just from what I see going on at The New Yorker, I mean, I love print. I love paper. I'm happy that our magazine is still printed. But we have an enormous web department. The online presence of The New Yorker grows and grows, and all magazines and newspapers have to have an online presence. And all those articles online have to be copy edited, too. And our hope at The New Yorker is to bring the um, electronic copy up to the standards of the print copy. It's hard because there's so much volume and it has to go up so fast. But what I would say is um, go into the web, you know, do the electronic thing, learn code. <laughs> the other thing you should do if you're majoring in journalism, I think, is have a specialty that's not the dairy industry. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I mean, dance, or a lot of people have had success with dance. Um, sociology, then you can go out in the field and get material. 
Yes. For all the typos that you've caught, has there been one that slipped by you, was published incorrectly, and came back to haunt you? <laughs> um, just one. <laughs> My first, I describe in the book, was that um, we got a letter um, from a reader. This was when I was first on the copy desk that it clipped out something and sent it in saying, are the glory days of the New Yorker gone forever? And it was a, a piece that I had had a hand in that spelled um, Chaise Long, Chase Lounge. So I tried to tell them that's how we spell it in Ohio. <laughs> but, but it turns out it's a chair chaise that is long and not a chair that you lounge in. You know, I think it's a natural mistake. <laughs> there was another thing that came through once that um, I was actually kind of amused by. There was a talk story about a woman named Mrs. Pensig. And that did come out Mrs. Penis G. <laughs> and then there was something not too long ago that was totally my mistake. Um, I think it was about Trump and Sarah Palin, and the writer said that they were proponents of the know-nothingism <laughs> party. And I let that go through, spelt N-O, no, nothingism. And, um, of course, it should have been K-N-O-W, no nothing. So I tried to defend that, too, you know, saying that's, that's American vernacular for nihilism. No, <laughs> nothingism. <laughs> Um, but it feels terrible when you have a mistake go through, and I often, you know, it's humbling. I can't sleep that night. But the next day, it's okay. You know, it's not the end of the world. An editor told me early on, um, you three strikes and you're out. <laughs> and really scared me, but um, I've made many more and then three mistakes. I'm, I'm sorry to say. Yes? You know, some of the articles are, are so long and complicated. <laughs> So much material. Do you have a mantra or something, a way you focus on this to maintain concentration? Um, well, you know, when I'm reading something long and it's not on deadline, when I'm reading it for the first time in that galley form before it's going to press, that's when I do what I call sleep proof reading. <laughs> I might just I might just doze off and wake up and um, that's not so good, you know, I mean. <laughs> but when something is on deadline, I that galvanizes me. I know I can't doze off. I have to read it. And, um, and I think especially since I've had this book, and it's, it's, it's kind of like having a magnifying glass trained on you and extra heat, um, they're extra... I, I, I would come in for extra criticism if I let anything slide. So I, you know, our, our motto is um, constant vigilance. And our other motto is do no harm. <laughs> yes, back there? Um, what usage guides do we use? References? Uh, my favorite usage guide is an enormous book called Garner's Modern American Usage. It's, it's the American version of Fowler's Modern English Usage, and it's exhaustive and it's quite entertaining. Brian Garner was a lawyer, and so his pronouncements, he, I guess he, he has done workshops with lawyers. Lawyers need to be clear, and um, his judgments are very even-seeming. So. It, and he even has a scale at the bottom of each page showing where in the good usage uh, values whatever he's talking about lies. And he'll, he'll tell you this is um, very bad or this is not so good but it's being widely accepted or this is widely accepted. And I like him. I find it entertaining to read. And the more you read it, the more you can read between the lines and really know that Brian Garner is deeply prescriptivist even though he... Um, pays lip service to descriptivism. <laughs> so we can continue this outside, I'm told, right? Well, I, I have a request of all of you. Please give this wonderful woman oh. <laughs> a reason to go back to New York City and tell Sandy Frazier how much our community loved her. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you so much. You had me a little worried there with the go back to New York City.